When I talk to people uh, who are skeptical of the Christian faith, when I talk to people who have walked away from the Christian faith, in fact, uh, for some of us, this is your story. You're sort of coming back to church or checking church out. Uh, when I talk to people who just can't believe or they believed it sometime and they just sort of uh, chunked the whole thing somewhere along the way, uh, oftentimes, and you've probably noticed this before as well in conversations with family members or coworkers who are skeptical of Christianity, uh, people will often say, uh, well, I like Jesus, I'm fine with Jesus, uh, whether it's the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is all right with me, uh, but the, um, uh, the, the, the hang-up, the tripwire that people often point to, in my experience, they point to one of three things. They'll say something like, I'm, I'm fine with Jesus, uh, but the tripwire to Christianity uh, is often the bad behavior of Christians. Uh, that's often what people will point to, and they'll say something like, I like Jesus, uh, but it's my super religious Aunt Kathy who drives me nuts. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's my judgmental relative that I avoid at the, at the barbecue, or you're going to avoid later at the Easter luncheon with family, or you, you guys probably had, had brunch, never mind. Um, it's that relative who, who makes comments. It's that person, and you go, you know what, I like Jesus. I'm fine with the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I like the things Jesus says about how to treat the poor, but man, the, the bad behavior of Christians, the judgmental nature of Christians, how Christians have treated people historically uh, is a tripwire uh, to following Christ. When I talk to other people, and, and if you and I had lunch and we started talking about your doubts or your skeptical, uh, your, your, your nature and just you know, your big pushbacks with the Christian faith, some of us, you wouldn't point to the bad behavior of Christians, you would point to a bad church experience somewhere along the way or a set of bad church experiences as your major hang up with the Christian faith. Uh, some of us, you, you know, you would say, you know what, I, I tried church when I was a kid, or maybe you went to a church where it was, uh, it was stand up, and it was sit down, and it was stand up, and it was sit down, and it was just confusing, and it didn't seem relevant to life, or maybe you went to a church, and some of us, maybe you had this experience today, you walked in, and it was uh, music, and you know, you weren't quite sure what was going on, and people had their eyes closed, and somebody had a hand up, and you thought, does he have a question? You know, what is going on? Um, <laughs> And somebody else had two hands like, you have two questions? What is that? Is that how this works? Uh, just seemed confusing. It didn't seem relevant to life. In fact, the only t time it seemed relevant is when somebody died. That's when you went to church and uh, you were at a funeral. And so you just, you, you know, you would kind of point to uh, a bad church experience or you would point to the fact that it just didn't seem relevant to life as your tripwire uh, to biting down or believing in this idea of Jesus and resurrection. Others of us, if the lunch went on a little bit longer and you got a little bit more honest, some of us would say, if I'm honest, Jared, uh, my issue is, is uh, you know, maybe it's the bad church experience, maybe it's the bad behavior of Christians, but some of us, you would say, my issue with Christianity, uh, the Bible just seems like bad science. Uh, and your pushback, and you, you, know, you would just say, I just don't understand how in an iPhone and in a Google world, logical, reasonable people can read stories about talking snakes and whales that regurgitate people and uh, David and Goliath, and where are the dinosaurs in here anyway? Uh, uh, and then you, your big hang up would be, I just can't sign up for that. I just can't believe in that. And if that's you, or you've ever had doubts about the Christian faith, or you've ever just sort of pushed back from the whole thing, uh, I would ask you if we were at lunch, I would say you just have to consider Easter. If you said, why do you believe this whole thing? I would say you would have to just, I would just ask you to consider Easter, because we do not celebrate Easter as Christians for 2,000 years. We do not celebrate Easter uh, because historically, Christians have been so much fun to hang out with. <laughs> Uh, we don't celebrate Easter because for 2,000 years, uh, church has been such a compelling or engaging experience. Uh, we do not celebrate Easter. We don't celebrate Easter because the Bible tells us to celebrate Easter. In fact, we don't know about Easter because it's in the Bible. Really, the opposite is true. We have the Bible in the form that we have it in uh, because of Easter. It was the resurrection of Jesus that validated the other 66 books, and it was the resurrection. In fact, for the first 334 Easter's or so, they didn't even have a Bible. They didn't believe this because it was in the Bible, and if you had questions and if you have doubts about Christianity, I would ask you to consider Easter because Easter, we believe in Easter, not because of the church, not because of Christians, not even necessarily because of the Bible. Uh, we know the Bible or we have the Bible because Easter validates the rest of the Bible. I would ask you to consider Easter because Easter is built around this idea, and it's this simple, that people saw something. That's why we celebrate Easter. Because people, 2,000 years ago, a handful of people in the city of Jerusalem, 
saw something and they could not explain it, but they couldn't deny what they saw. And the people that originally saw this very first Easter, a man resurrected, a Nazarite sage walking out of a tomb, they had no vested interest in this being true. None of the followers of Jesus in the early days of this whole sort of Jesus thing taking hold, none of them had a vested interest in this being true. They knew that if they began to tell people not what they should believe, but what they saw, they were not going to get rich from telling people this. Uh, In fact, the opposite would happen. They would get killed for telling people what they saw. And if you've ever had questions about Christianity, Jesus, pushbacks, or you've been frustrated at God, I would ask you to consider Easter because it is Easter that has changed everything and it is Easter, the resurrection of Jesus, that is the linchpin and the crux of our faith. I would ask you to consider Easter. Easter, whether you believe in Jesus or not, has changed everything for all of history. Because the teachings of Jesus, which have shaped the contours of law, they've shaped the contours of government, they've shaped human ethics of how we treat people, that it's, you know, a responsible person behaves in a particular fashion or a particular way, that comes from the teachings of Jesus. And at the crucifixion of Jesus, which all scholars agree took place, that he was crucified on the side of a Roman highway, at the crucifixion of Jesus, nobody was going to follow or listen to the teachings of Jesus. But it was his resurrection, it was the first Easter that validated and made all the teachings, the Sermon on the Mount, whatever uh, you know, teachings of Jesus that you've read, it was Easter, it was resurrection that validated the rest of the story. Resurrection, Easter, literally changed everything, whether you are a Christian or not. It changed the face of the world, it changed the face of history. It literally split time because resurrection validated the life of Jesus. And it's so unbelievable, whether you're a Christian or not, just from a historical perspective, just to consider Easter. This story of resurrection, this story of Jesus walking out of a tomb, this should not have survived the first century. 2,000 years ago, in the world where this story begins to take hold and people begin to tell people not what to believe, but what they've seen, this message of resurrection, uh, it begins to spread in a world, uh, and most of us, you remember this from history class, where, where the Roman Empire, the most powerful empire to ever exist in terms of how much of the world they've colonized at this point, the, the entire Roman world believed that Julius Caesar was God. That was the belief. Uh, Some of us, you remember Julius Caesar from uh, the Shakespeare play, but Julius Caesar, uh, he had been dead for a while. I'm not quite sure how that worked, but the belief was in this world that Julius Caesar was God and his son, Augustus Caesar, was the son of God. And the Roman Senate, the most powerful Senate that has ever been seated really in the history of the world, they believe this. All the smart people, all of the powerful people in the ancient world believed this to be true. They would put it on money. In fact, they would kill you if you did not be, believe this and bow down to the fact that Julius Caesar is God. That's the way the world worked 2,000 years ago. And it is unprecedented and unthinkable just from a historical standpoint that here we are 2,000 years later and nobody celebrates Caesar as God. Nobody believes that in our world. In fact, Caesar, historically, he didn't even get a day on the calendar to honor his life. Caesar did not even get a a month of the year. Caesar did not get a a country named after him. All Caesar got was a salad, for crying out loud. (laughs) That was it. That's unbelievable. Uh, 2,000 years, I'm not not sure if it's too soon for a Caesar joke, uh, if that's offensive. I mean, could you imagine if Caesar knew that, that, you know, 2,000 years later, people are worshiping Jesus in churches, and the only place celebrating his legacy is Olive Garden. I mean, that's, that's really it. <laughs> it's unprecedented from a historical standpoint, that and a low-cost pizza joint that calls him little. I'm not so sure how you'd feel about that. <laughs> that joke's a slow burn, but when you get it, man, it's good. <laughs> it's good. Uh, and 2,000 years later, this is just unbelievable historically, Two billion Christians, two billion people in the world will gather today to declare, not because it was in the Bible, not because of church, not because Christians have been so great to hang out with. People will gather to declare what people saw as a historical event, that Jesus of Nazareth has been resurrected. A man who never traveled far from his house, a man who by all witness accounts was crucified on the side of a Roman highway, a man who never held political office, has been risen from 
the dead. And it's this reality, it's the first Easter that has changed all of history. Easter changes everything. That's just the nature of Easter. That's the nature of resurrection. And we celebrate that a man, not because it's in the Bible, but because of history tells us this, that, that, that somebody saw something that they could not explain, but they also could not deny. And this is the story. If you uh, want to follow along on the screens, that's a great place to follow along. I'm going to put these verses up behind me, uh, but these will also be in the CRB app. That's a great place to follow along as well. You can download that uh, from uh, the internets. Uh, <laughs> the, um, uh, this is the story. Now we know this story because there's four writers that write this down, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And these stories are written down uh, not because they thought this will make a great Bible story. Uh, they didn't write this down because they thought, man, this is right up there with David and Goliath and Jonah and the whale and Adam and Eve. You know, we need another great story. No, they wrote this down. The story is contained in the Bible, but it's not contained by the Bible. The story is written down because they're just telling people what they saw. And they're recording this the way a journalist for the San Diego Tribune or the way that any story, uh, anybody who's reporting on events is reporting on it. They're telling you what they saw. And this is John, one of the four writers of this story. This is his version of what happened on the first Easter. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. And one of the things you'll notice if you've read the Bible is that the writers of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they often put people's names in the story. And the reason they're doing that is because they're saying, this did not occur in Narnia. Uh, this did not take place uh, in a galaxy far, far away. Uh, ask Mary Magdalene. You can, she's over there. You can go talk. That was the essential reason they were writing her name into the story, because they're going, ask her. This is the first century equivalent of posting a photo on Instagram and tagging somebody. Uh, you're letting people know uh, she was actually there. John is saying, fact check the story. It's true. You need to ask this person. You need to ask this person. Not what to believe, but what they have seen. And this is his version of the story. She goes to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple. By the way, John, the one who's writing this, is the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. I love that. <laughs> Isn't that great? He's like Peter. He's like third, fourth down the list, but I'm the one that Jesus loved. So good. Uh, it gets even better. Uh, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple, again, that's John, started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter. <laughs> I love that. People are walking out of tombs, and John's like, I'm really fast, by the way. <laughs> Story's going to live forever. I'll throw a fun fact in here about myself. It's like he's seven. I just, so, uh, it's just great. Uh, the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen that were lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus's head. He's just telling you what he sees. The cloth was still lying in its place separate from the linen. And the description of the death garments is essentially a way to say to the people that are reading this for the first time, uh, he actually has been risen. The death garments have been removed. Uh, this is a resurrection. The cloth was still lying in its place separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first <laughs> also went inside he saw and he believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. And they're not writing this down as fairy tale. They're not writing this down as legend. They're not writing this down the way that fairy tales and legends are written down from the perspective of, a, of an omniscient storyteller. They're writing this down, telling people what they've seen. And they're doing this knowing they have no vested interest in this being true. That if they begin to tell people what they've seen, they know what the implications are for them. They're not going to get rich. They're not going to have, you know, you're not telling people this because they want to get famous. They know that they are now going to be outlaws and fugitives on the run for the rest of their lives. And eventually they would all be hunted down and killed for telling people what they 
They saw, but they couldn't deny it. They couldn't even figure out necessarily how to explain it. They, I don't know how this works. I don't know how he did this, but we can't deny what we have seen. And this message of resurrection has had such a massive impact on the world. This message of resurrection has been so sweeping, the events that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John recorded, that all of history has had to deal with it at some level. All religions have to deal with Jesus at some level. Everybody has to consider Jesus at some level. All religions, all worldviews have to deal with Jesus because his effects are so massive on the human timeline. This message simply cannot be ignored. It has to be put somewhere in somebody's, in, in, in your belief system. This is why, and this isn't for the sake of comparative religions, uh, but a lot of us, you know this, in the Buddhist faith, and this is hundreds of millions of people uh, in the world, in the Buddhist tradition, in the Buddhist faith, uh, Buddhism teaches that Jesus was enlightened. Jesus was not resurrected, but he was enlightened, much like Buddha himself was enlightened. And hundreds of millions of people believe this. Uh, Jesus has to be considered at some point level. He cannot be ignored. All scholars, all religions know, or they essentially believe that Jesus was a man. He was crucified on the side of a Roman highway, uh, and, and they have to do something with him. Uh, Hinduism, the Hindu faith, hundreds of millions of people in our world believe in the Hindu faith. And their belief, much like Buddhism, is that he's not resurrected, but he's incarnated. He's incarnated, much like Krishna, one of the, the Hindu gods, uh, that, that he is an incarnation of God, but not God resurrected himself. Everybody has to consider Jesus. He cannot be ignored. Uh, Islam the, the Muslim faith, uh, their belief is that Jesus uh, is not God, certainly not resurrected, but was a man, was a prophet, a real person uh, who's inferior to the prophet Muhammad. Every faith system, every religion has to consider Jesus at some level. Uh, every worldview considers Jesus. Uh, in the modern world, the, the new atheist movement, and if you've never heard of the new atheist movement, it has had a profound impact on what millennials in particular in our world believe. Some of us, you have sons or daughters that you raised in church and they walked away. In fact, uh, you weren't able to get them to come with you on Easter and you thought, even on Easter, you're not gonna show up to church. And they indirectly, whether they know this or not, have been impacted by new atheist perspectives. And this is Richard Dawkins, this is uh, Christopher Hitchens, this is uh, Sam Harris, uh, there's three or four Daniel Dennett authors. They call themselves the four horsemen of the non-apocalypse, uh, which I sort of just love that. Uh, but they, uh, they have had a profound impact and they have written books that have sold millions of copies. Really, it's been in response to 9-11 uh, when religion became such a hot button issue in our world 15, uh, 17 years ago. And their, their writings and what they have said are scathing critiques, not just on Christianity, but on religion as a whole. And they have essentially said, it's time to let go of fairy tale. It's time to let go of fable. It's all just legend. But even in this world, the new atheist perspectives, and they have been rock stars. They have gone on late night talk shows. They've sold millions and millions of books. And they've had a profound impact on what people in the modern world believe. But they have to consider Jesus. His life cannot be denied. And Richard Dawkins, one of the leaders of the New Atheist Movement, he essentially says this, that Jesus was just a good moral teacher. But the belief about resurrection and the belief about Easter, come on, man. <laughs> That's just legend and fairy tale that some of his followers stapled onto his life and his story later on. Everybody has to consider Easter. Everybody has to consider Jesus at some level. Deepak Chopra, uh, one of, you've probably seen Deepak Chopra interviewed at some uh, point, whether it's on a talk show or uh, somewhere before. Deepak Chopra is a, is a new age guru, spiritualist, and Deepak Chopra teaches and he believes that Jesus is a state of consciousness that we all should aspire to. Everybody has to consider Jesus, whether from a worldview perspective or whether from a religious perspective. His message, his life is too massive and too sweeping to be denied. And the default position of the modern world, the default position of the world that we live in is essentially that Jesus is a good moral teacher, he's a state of consciousness, but Easter, resurrection, uh, that is a fable, that is a fairy tale, that is a legend that got stapled onto the story later on. And millions and millions of people in our world believe that, that this idea of Easter is just 
a legend. In fact, often what begins to happen, you've had conversations like this perhaps with coworkers or friends. What we begin to do in the modern world is we take the, the Easter story, the resurrection story, and it gets lumped into the rest of the Bible. And people put it in there with, you know, Jonah and the whale and David and Goliath and who else, you know, Fox and the Hound, can't re quite remember. It's all sort of, you know, the, the Gaston story. It's all sort of uh, in there somewhere. Uh, can't quite figure out which is which. Uh, but, the, but it all sort of just gets lumped into the Bible and people keep an arm's length from resurrection and Easter saying it's all fairy tale. Everything that's in the Bible is just legend. It's just fable. And the problem with that is the first Christians, the first people that began to believe this, they didn't believe it because it was in the Bible. That didn't come around until three or four, around 330 years later that we have the Bible in the current form that we have it. They believed it simply because people saw something that they could not explain and they could not deny. And if you've ever been tempted to dismiss the Easter story as just legend, as just fable, the problem with that is that sociologists and scholars now know, we've lived long enough as civilizations, how fable and how legends develop and how they can distort actual reality and historical events. And scholars know that what essentially takes place uh, to distort an actual historical person or an actual historical event is that it takes at least 70 years or two full generations of people that come and go before a legend can develop and distort an actual person or an actual historical event. Uh, it would be unprecedented for a legend to develop with it before 70 years of that actual historical event. And uh, another way to explain that, if I tried to convince you that John F. Kennedy was risen from the dead, if I had a lot of money and a lot of people convinced and I wanted to tell you that and I was trying to attach a legend to an actual historical person and an actual historical event, it would be unprecedented that people would begin to believe that because people that were there, it was only 55 years ago or so, people that were there would say, uh-uh, we saw it, we know what happened. And it sort of makes sense logically that the further you get from a historical event, the easier it becomes, hundreds and hundreds of years later, for fable and legend to get attached to a historical person or a historical event. It takes at least 70 years or two full generations of people. The reason I say that is because here's what we know, not from the Bible, but here's what we know from history. Jesus of Nazareth was crucified on the side of a Roman highway somewhere around April 3rd of the year 33 AD. And when he was crucified, he had exactly zero followers. When he died on that Friday afternoon, there was nobody who was going to follow a dead man. And he had perhaps hundreds of followers at that point, at least 12. But in that particular moment, when Jesus of Nazareth was crucified, it's upsetting, I know. <laughs> Is that mine? <laughs> when Jesus of Nazareth was crucified, you had exactly zero people that were willing to follow a man that they saw crucified. There was, nobody was gonna follow him. And here's what we know, not from the Bible, but here's what we know from history. We know that when Jesus of Nazareth was crucified, shortly after that, within weeks, within months, by that summer of the year 33 AD, in the city of Jerusalem, the very city where he had been crucified, there were thousands of followers of Jesus. Not because it had been written down in the Bible, not because they heard it in a church service, not because of Christians, that wasn't even around yet. People believed this because it was what they had seen. And the very city where Jesus had been crucified, within a matter of weeks and months and within the, in the short few years after the resurrection, people began to believe that Jesus of Nazareth had been risen from the dead. This is not the stuff of legend. This is not the stuff of fairy tale. This is what people saw. They couldn't explain it, but they couldn't deny that he had been risen from the dead. This is the story that we believe. And within a few years, the way this began to change the shape of history is so unbelievable. It was 30 years later, around the year 64 AD, some of us, you remember this from history class, Nero, who's the most powerful person in the entire world in the year 64 AD, he's the emperor of all of Rome. And in the year 64 AD, what we know, and this is not in the Bible, it's just from history, we know that Nero started a fire to burn, some of us, you remember this, Nero started a fire and he burns the city of Rome. 
And do you remember who he blamed for burning the city of Rome? Anybody? He blames Paul and he blames the Christians. Which means within 30 years of the resurrection of Jesus, just a, a few thousand miles away from where Jesus had been resurrected, there were thousands and thousands of people in the city of Rome, the most powerful city and the most powerful emperor, is going to persecute. You remember what he did? He persecuted it and he blames Christians because there were thousands of Christians in Rome in that particular moment in the year 64 A. D. This is not the stuff of legend. It's not the stuff of fairy tale. There were thousands of Christians there, not because it was in the Bible, but because people had seen something that they could not explain and they could not deny. And they had no vested interest in this being true, especially in the first century world. They would be persecuted. They would be killed. All the people that saw this and began to declare it from the early group of Jesus followers would be killed for what they were going to tell people what they had seen. This is not the stuff of legend. When I begin to have doubts and I begin to wrestle with my faith and I begin to, you know, just go, how in the world could this be true? I always go back to Easter. <laughs> It's Easter that is the linchpin of our faith. It's Easter, it is the resurrection of Jesus that validates everything else that we believe as Christians. When I have doubts and I have you know, frustrations with God, I always think about two people in particular. The first is Mary Magdalene. We sort of read over this, but what does John tell us? What do the other gospel writers tell us? It's Mary Magdalene who comes to the tomb of Jesus first. And we sort of you know, read over that, but what's so unbelievable about that is that in the Roman world, in the ancient Jewish world where this story took place, when, when this happens, uh, a, a, a woman in the first century world, her testimony would not have even been valid in a courtroom. Women were thought so lowly of in the first century world. And the reason I say that is because if you were going to make up a fable or a fairy tale or a legend trying to convince people that Jesus of Nazareth had been risen from the dead, the last thing in the world you would do is say that it was a woman who saw Jesus first. The only reason you would record that detail is if it was actually a woman who saw Jesus first. And it's James, and, or, and it's, it's John's, and it's Matthew's, and it's Luke's way of saying this is a true story, and it has to change everything regardless of what the implications are for those who believe it. It has to change everything. I also think about James. James is the brother of Jesus, and in the lifetime of Jesus, he was there for many of the miracles that Jesus would have done. James was not convinced that his brother was the Messiah. But later, he would become convinced. And the resurrection of Lazarus doesn't do it for him. Walking on water doesn't do it for him. But when he sees his brother, Jesus, walk out of the tomb, James, he goes on later to write a book so creatively titled The Book of James. Uh, but James, when he sees his brother come out of the tomb, he is convinced that his brother is the son of God. And he would eventually die for proclaiming this in the first century world. Not what he wanted people to believe, but what he had seen and he could not deny. The reason that's so unbelievable to me is how many of us in this room, you have a brother? <laughs> Let me ask you a question. What would it take for your brother to be convinced that you're the son of God? <laughs> Some of us, you can't even convince your brother that you're going to be on time for lunch today, okay? <laughs> James is convinced all the way to the point of his death. And if you and I were having lunch and you were going, I just can't bite, I just can't believe, I would ask you to consider Easter and then I would lean over the table and I would say, hey, what would it take for you to be willing to die for a lie, something you knew wasn't true? Because the people that began to proclaim this and announce this in the ancient world, what they had seen, they would go be killed for what they were telling people had happened. And it has to change everything. It certainly did for the first Christians. Regardless of the implications for them or for us, if we begin to believe this, if we begin to consider Easter, it has to change everything for you and for me. And if you and I were at lunch and we were talking, you were going, I still can't believe, and you were to ask me, Jared, why in the world in 2018 would you still believe this story? Why would you put your faith in this story? I would say what many of you in this room would say, don't believe in Easter because it's going to make your life easier. It's not. We do not proclaim and announce Easter because it's a crutch in our weak moments. 
It doesn't make life easier. In fact, many of you in this room, you would tell the story that if it wasn't for Jesus, if it wasn't for resurrection, you could go out and live a far more indulgent life. <laughs> if it wasn't for Jesus, if it wasn't for resurrection, how much easier would it, would it be to not love your enemies? How much easier would it be to hold on to bitterness and to not forgive? Jesus doesn't come. We don't believe in Easter because it makes our life easier. It doesn't. In fact, that's a very Western idea that Christianity makes people's life easier. Even in the world today, more people will gather in secret to declare that the tomb is empty. And they will gather in secret because in various corners of the globe, even in 2018, this is still a dangerous message and they can be killed for believing this. We don't follow Jesus because it makes our life easier. We believe in Easter because we believe it's true, that people saw something. And if it's true, it has to change everything about your life and it has to change everything about my life. And if you and I were at lunch, I wouldn't ask you to consider the Bible. I wouldn't ask you to consider Christians. I wouldn't ask you to consider your church experiences. I would ask you to consider Easter. Independent of your relationship with Christians, independent of your church experiences, independent of all your questions about the Bible, you have to consider Easter, that people saw something. And if this is true, if what we celebrate is true, oh my goodness, it hasn't just changed everything for the world, it has to change everything for you, and it has to change everything for me. And we celebrate this. The best way we can talk about this isn't just with words, it's to celebrate it. And so as we thought about how to end our time together at Easter, we said the best way to respond to what people have seen, to what we believe as Christians, is life-changing truth. A man named Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. We said we have to celebrate together.